And good afternoon, everybody. Gary Allen with you here at 4 p.m. on Main Street, right here on twitch.tv slash drinks, jokes, capital N, storytelling. We are live on Facebook, live on YouTube. Hope you had a wonderful week since the last time we were here. I'm going to warn you, next week, I won't be here. Tom Bannis is going to take over. I'm taking a week off. Over the next few weeks or so, that'll over the next month to six weeks, that may happen a few more times as I get some medical stuff taken care of. I hope you guys don't mind. Nothing serious. I will be back next week. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have Tom on. I don't know who his guests will be or who will be there, but it doesn't really matter. This week, I have two fabulous guests, two uh, award-winning songwriters, gentlemen who have Academy Awards, Grammy Award nominations, BMI awards. Uh, Stacy is a renowned photographer. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, they are two gentlemen who wrote songs for Dirty Dancing, uh, won many awards, and their common denominator is, of course, Patrick Swayze. Stacy was better friends with him, I guess, than John. I was just informed of that. But nevertheless, we're going to talk about songwriting. We're going to talk about their lives, how they got where they are, and there's some fantastic stories that we're going to cover and go over. We hope, and I look forward to your comments. So without further ado, let me introduce these gentlemen to you, Mr. John DiNicola and Mr. Stacy Wetlitz. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Hello. Glad hey. to be here. Hey, hello, yeah. hello, hello, hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on Main Street. I know you guys could be doing a thousand and one different things. Um, John, what part of the country are you in? Because I think you're in New York, right? I am in New York, upstate New York, uh, central New York State. Um, I'm also uh, usually in New York City in Greenwich Village, but I haven't been back there in a year. Wow. My son is there now, but uh, we're, we're, we've holed up upstate New York and I have a recording studio, so it's not terrible. And John, or Stacy, you're in Tennessee or, or L.A.? Yeah. Uh, in Tennessee, I um, I'm in Oak Hill, Tennessee, which is just south of Nashville, just south oh, okay. of downtown. I was there once for a wedding, and I'm trying to remember the county we were in, but it was a dry county. And, oh, uh, yeah, uh, that's oddly um, where Jack Daniels is made in Tennessee. <laughs> it, it's it's a dry county, so the unbelievable. The irony is rich, you know. It's just. Uh, <laughs> It's ridiculous. Before we get into all this crazy, why is it a dry county? We're this is 2021. Is you know, it just religious reasons, or just yeah, they don't want to change the books? It's it's old ways of doing things down here. It's I I actually have heard the Civil War here referred to as the War of Northern Aggression. Yes. So so it's it's a re, you don't realize until you move to the South that it's a whole different world. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, I've performed many times uh, opening for one act or another, traveling through the South. And yeah, they do. Are you a Yankee? Yeah. You know, and, and they keep forgetting that the first uh, the first bullets that were fired, the first guns that went off were in Fort Sumter, South Carolina, for God's yeah. sake. So, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hey, Mickey, how are you doing? Mickey Souls, number 23. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, was music something that you both, I know, Stacy, if you aspired to it, you liked it. And we'll get about your fourth grade teacher in just a little bit. But John, was this something that as a young man, you said, yeah, I mean, I love music. I love listening to it. And this is a direction I want to take my life. Yeah, I would say from an early age, uh, I was just uh, actually just doing an interview uh, in, in the UK and he wanted me to list eight influential songs. And the first one that I can remember that, convinced me to be a musician was mm -hmm. Woman by Roy Orbison. I was seven, eight, nine years old and yeah. everything about that, the guitar lick, the the mournful voice, the, the unrequited love, but then she comes back at the end. I said, okay, music, that's that's gonna, that's it. Uh, one other little bit, I guess, I uh, my brother had a guitar and I used to go down to the basement, again, seven, eight, nine years old, yeah. pick guitar i didn't know anything on my left hand i was just plucking the strings and my i heard my mother from upstairs go i i think he sounds like he'd be good on guitar and so that was it i was just you know ever yeah. since then I've, I've been myopic and never doubted that i would do music i love roy orbison's black and white the uh performance that he did and i presume it was probably in the south somewhere with all the no. famous people on stage with him it was in. I was actually there. 
for the table. Oh! Yeah, I was in the room. That's a great Patrick Swayze story, by the way. Because Tell what happened, it. it was 1987, shortly after Dirty Dancing was released, maybe a month. So he's now this huge star and getting invited to all this stuff. And that show was shot at the old Ambassador Theater in LA. That's what I thought. Yeah. Oh. And, and I was sitting at home and I, you know, I lived about 15, 20 minutes away from the Ambassador Theater. Yep. And uh, my phone rang and it was Patrick, whom I knew as, as Buddy, his family and friends called him Buddy. And he said, hey, it's Buddy. How fast can you get dressed and get to the Ambassador Theater? And I said, I don't know. I could be there in a half an hour. Why? And he said, you have to just trust me. Just get here. And uh, he said, I'm going to tell a security guard, uh, you know, to expect you and just, you know. And so I trusted him. I thought, you know, he's not going to steer me wrong. So no. I, I drove down to the Ambassador Theater. Security guard met me, brought me in. Mm -hmm. And I looked in the, that big room where they shot it. And I'm looking on stage and I see everybody's warming up and I see Bruce Springsteen. I see uh, Elvis Costello, uh, Bonnie Raitt, right. uh, uh, T-Bone Burnett, you know, all the, all these people. And I'm just like, what the heck yeah. is yeah. this? Yeah. You know, and um, <clears throat> so then Buddy saw me and brought me over to the table. And what's interesting is they actually took about four, four and a half hours to shoot the whole thing because there were retakes. So we got to see different takes. And during one of the pauses, um, a bunch of us went into the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel and stood at the spot where Robert F. Kennedy was shot. Oh. Uh, because he, he was assassinated in that hotel. Yes. And I um, yeah. so, it, it, but the, the evening, and then there was an after party and I got to meet Roy Orbison at the after party. Oh, that had to be was, a treat. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Wasn't Billy Idol in the audience? It's very possible. I mean, there were so many people there. It was it was star-studded. Well, I've told this story before, but it's very similar to what you did. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I got an apartment up off of where La Brea turns into Franklin, right yeah. below the Magic Castle. And right. I worked security at the Beverly Center. And yeah. so I could audition during the day. Uh, I mean, you know, what a great mall it was. And, and, you know, it was great stuff. Anyway, I come home and, you know, there's no cell phones back in those days or any of that stuff. So there's a message on the phone. Gary, come home, take a shower, show up at A&M Records. My roommate was an engineer at A&M Records. Come down. The security guard has your name. Come in to the studio, sit down and shut up and watch. So I'm thinking, what the heck is this all about? But tomorrow I'm off, so I don't care. I go into the thing and I walk down the hallway. The security guard let me in. I walked down the hallway. Herb Alpert was in his office. I peeked in. I said, hey, Mr. Albert, how are you doing? He said, hey, Gare, you're here for the session. I said, yeah, go down. Da, 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 da. And, and, and Art told me to tell you to shut up. I said, okay, fine. Guess what they're doing that night? We are the world. Oh, God. That's great. And, and, and I just, uh, yeah, uh, Frankie, Frankie uh, Pavet, who was a friend for both of you gentlemen, he, he, his girlfriend, Lisa, helped do some stuff with post uh, uh, production. And I've told that story many times. And, and of course, they recently had the anniversary and I completely forgot about half of the entertainers. But I got to meet, uh, you know, Kenny Rogers, who became a good friend of mine. And I opened for him a few times in my life and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, I, I love those coincidences. Now, Stacy, I want to get into this story because we talked about it beforehand. And, John, I, I pipe in, please. Mm -hmm. Your fourth grade band teacher told your mom and dad through a note, I believe, that you had no musical ability at all whatsoever. Talk about that story, please. Well, I had signed up for the band program. And, um, you know, the, the way they did it, they gave you a sheet and you could mark down what instrument you wanted to learn. And so I put down as my first choice cello because I thought it was a beautiful instrument. Yeah. And I don't even remember what my second choice was. My third choice was flute. So, of course, I get assigned the flute. And I can't make heads. So my parents rent me a flute, you know, and I'm trying to practice it. I'm trying to learn how to read the music, which is all based on the fingering. And I can't make heads or tails of this thing. It made no sense to me whatsoever. You know, I, I might as well have just been swinging it like a stickball bat. And um, after about a month of struggling with it, the band director, Mr. Severoli, 
sent me home with that note. And uh, my parents were fairly horrified. Uh, but around that same time, my uh, father had picked up an old beat up upright Wurlitzer piano uh, mm -hmm. and put it in the basement. And I started picking out tunes with one finger. You know, I could, you know, pick out the like theme songs for television shows and things like mm -hmm. that. And um, my cousin was a child prodigy concert pianist. And he was stuck at my house one time uh, in a snowstorm and gave me my first piano lesson. And it made perfect sense to me. All of a sudden, it all gelled yeah, yeah. because it was laid out logically. And he's the one that told my parents, get him piano lessons. He just went through 10 weeks of the method book in an hour. So it, you know, it, was, uh, it, it was good to know that Mr. Severoli was actually wrong. So. <laughs> and and uh, of which, go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say flute. I I am I'm a bass player, but I'm a multi instrumentalist. I play everything, just about everything. I cannot play a flute. I mean, I play soprano sax, bass clarinet. I'm marimba. I'm organ, keyboards, guitar, bass. I picked up a flute, and I, I can't make heads or tails out of it yeah. to this yeah. day. Do you think? Do you think that? you know, like Mozart and Beethoven and, and back because I, my love is classical music and jazz. Do you think that um, it just comes from somewhere within you when you were born, that ability to pick it up right away without any lessons where a guy like me, I'd be at this for 20 years and never catch up to either one of you on any of that stuff. I, I think that the ability to play an instrument can be taught. I think the ability to <clears throat> write music is inborn. Uh, that that is something that, you either have, it's like comedians say, you're either funny or you're not funny. Not funny, yeah. And so you can either write music or you can't write music. Now, once you find out that you have the ability to write, of course, you can sharpen your technical skills with that. Um, and But if, if you can't naturally write a melody, that, that can't be taught. I don't yeah, know, John. You, yeah, I probably agree with that. Uh, it almost seems... Uh, it, it's hard to to imagine that, you know what I mean? It's like, like I, I can't imagine what that would be like because it, it it's almost seems like it's channeled. It channels through you somehow. Right. A hungry eyes, for instance, musically on on the music end of that, it 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 was it was written in ten minutes. It I kind of just played it down. I got a particular sound on an old Roland Juno one hundred and six. And it just played itself down. And I don't know, I, you know, you don't always get it like that. You know, a lot of times it's a lot of start, stop, figure out this, that, and the other thing. But once in a while, it, it does channel through. You know, I, I'd say it's happened like 10 times in my life where it just played itself down. But uh, Hungry Eyes are obviously landing somewhere <laughs> nicely. But I, I, you know, I don't know what you think, Stacy, but I, I feel like it's almost. You're almost a vessel for it. You know? I think you ingest years. You have to be interested in music, and so you ingest it, you ingest it, every kind of shape and, and form, and then it just kind of regurgitates out in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I spent so much time uh, actually figuring out songs that I'd hear on a record, and uh, that plus I was in a, a, a lounge band starting at the age of 15, Right. playing stand, you know, girl from Ipanema, you know, stuff like that. Oh. And so, you know, playing like standards and yeah. then figuring out pop and rock songs. And, yeah. and I also got heavily into the blues um, that it, it's like you said, it's, it's like swimming in your head mm -hmm. and it shoots out in various ways. I can still hear a song today that, that I listened to as a kid and then I can draw a direct line from that song to something that I've written. Is it a compulsion once you learn the mechanics of it and you refine those to you? Is it like a compulsion, like an actor has to act as a talk show host? I have to be talking to you. I love what I do. I mean, I was trained by Larry King. So, I mean, you know, I think I just, you know, it's something that's, you know, I'm not, I wasn't a very good actor. By the way, the girl from Ipanema, I used to do a song on stage when I worked on the cruise ships. And you guys have heard this before, the girl from Emphysema. 
Uh, we we did the girl from Hiroshima. <laughs> that, was, that was another one. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny, but is you know, John, you said something interesting uh, about songwriting, and Stacy, you may have said it as, as well. Um, is it like comedy? You have to, there is a method to it. There's a rhythm to it. There's an understanding. And, and Stacy, I know you you love opera because you you are in charge of uh, in Nashville the Opera House, uh, you're on the board. John, I know you've been involved in other endeavors too, but jazz and classical music is the basis for everything that blanches out, which is I, which is what I loved about the Beatles because they would go to places like that with the harpsichord and other things that they incorporated into their music. Is that a good basis for anybody who wants to be a good musician, jazz and classical music, an understanding of the fundamentals? I think so. Uh, I would. I would also add uh, folk music uh, because you learn simplicity, and um, it's incredibly hard to be simple. Oh, um, damn. And yeah, and um, I would also add show. For me, show music was very uh, you know theater music, Broadway stuff. Mm -hmm. I obsessively listened to um, soundtrack records. And I think the first big musical experience for me that blew me away was when my parents took me to see Man of La Mancha when I was in sixth grade. Oh yeah. And and I walked out of the theater, you know, I'd been studying piano for a couple of years at that point, and it was beginning to maybe swirl in my head, you know, maybe this is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting. I was raised around classical music and jazz. My father didn't understand it so much, but my mother did. And my uncle, who was a stand-up comic, he did too. Uh, by the way, I want to remind everybody, uh, you're listening to uh, Main Street. You're watching with Stacey Weidlitz and John DiNicola. And we're talking about music, music writing. These gentlemen have won many awards, Academy Awards, Grammy nominations, BMI awards. Uh, and they do have the common denominator of having worked with Patrick Swayze on a number of uh, platforms. And we're going to talk about that as we continue to move forward. You gentlemen depend, as writers, have you ever worked together on any project? Other, no. than, other than Dirty Dancing, no. Yeah. And we didn't really work together on that either. It was right. just right. separately, but we ended up on the same record. And and there was a song. Yeah. And, and yeah. There was there was a song, uh, She's Like the Wind, that originally was in Dirty Dancing, but it wasn't supposed to be, was it, Stacy? Well, it, uh, Patrick, Buddy, and I actually wrote it for a different movie. Uh, what happened was when I moved to L.A., uh, not too long after, I was brought in to play piano for a friend of mine in an acting class. And that's where I met Patrick, who introduced himself as Buddy. And I discovered, talking to him, and then especially when his wife, Lisa, came over, that we lived around the block from each other. We, we lived two houses away from each other. Wow. And so he and I and his wife and my then-girlfriend, Wendy Fraser, uh, we all became friends and we would hang out and talk about music and theater and dance. And, um, and uh, he was working on a movie called Grandview USA. And he called me up and he said, hey, they're looking for songs for Grandview. I've had this idea for a song for a couple of years now, but I can't get anywhere with it. You want to work right. on it? Because he knew I was writing music for television. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, yeah, sure. Come on over. I mean, he lived around the block. So he mm -hmm. came over with his guitar and that's, was the uh, uh, beginning of, of She's Like the Wind. And then he took, and, and it was turned down for that movie. Right. And then it moved over. He took it over to Dirty Dancing. God, excuse me. I have my cat, Princess, who thinks she's part of every show that I do. She, enjoy, <laughs> she enjoys being part of it. Uh, she misses her brother, who is no longer with us. But uh. um, there are some funny stories that we're going to get into about Patrick. I didn't know that he was a pilot and his wife flew. Does she still fly to this day? Yes, she still has her license. Yeah, I unfortunately, because of my eyes, I lost mine uh, many years ago. I, mm -hmm. I I grew up with a captain as as my dad, and his his, his brothers were all airline pilots. Um, but we're going to talk about that. Is that the album, the the platinum behind you, that Patrick yes. delivered in a no, limo to you? The one that he delivered to me in the limo was uh, the first one that I received, which was triple platinum. Mm -hmm. And this is where it topped out um, 
according to the Recording Institute, which is uh, 11 times platinum in the U.S., mm -hmm. so, which represents 11 million records sold. Wait, oh, what wow. year was that? I, it's gotta be, it's, what year was that? I think it hit that in 94, 95. It's, it's a lot. I, I believe it's a lot more now. Well, yeah. Um, well, worldwide, it's in the 40s plus millions. Right. So, but th this just represents U.S. and Canada. I got to just U.S. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 worldwide, God only knows what what it probably ha has has probably done. Um, who were your influences growing up? I mean, and who are your influences even to this day? Uh well, gosh, there's so many. It, it, it's um, I I tell a story of I was about 12 years old, and my cousin uh, ran a um, a one stop out in Long Island and uh, one stop is where all the mom and pop stores buy their LPs from. Right. And uh, my mom took me in there and said, you can have three records. And um, I, I got Moby Grape's first record. I got Great record traffic, Mr. Fantasy. And I got Jimi Hendrix. Are you experienced? Oh, um, so I, I, you know, Steve Winwood, Traffic, uh, Moby Grape. Uh, to this day, I, I know them. Uh, I, I just did a record with one of the guys, Peter Lewis, who happens to be um, Loretta Young's son. Uh, I did a record with her, his daughter too. So uh, I've been around the Moby Grape guys, uh, Bob Mosley, the bass player and the singer with a huge voice. Uh, has been an influence on me. Um, you know, then I got into like Frank Zappa and Weather Report. And so, I mean, it's, uh, and, and you know, it, interestingly, this new record I'm working on uh, that I'm just about finishing. Is that uh, the Why Because? No, that was the last record. That was came out in 2019. And uh, I'm just finishing a, a new one. And, and both of them are odd because I never thought of myself as an artist before other than a songwriter and, and whatever right. else. But um, I, I'm noticing, uh, I'm trying to be s sort of contemporary. There's a band called Tame Impala and, and indie, you know, using a lot of synth stuff and that's right. happening. But I realize how much melodically 60s and 70s soul R&B is coming through. I mean, so mm -hmm. obviously, you know, stylistics and that kind of thing just had made a, a big uh, impact on on me as an artist. And, and that's been the most fun doing a record at this stage of my career is I'm discovering who I am as an artist, which is kind of fun because I never really knew <laughs> until now. You know, you know Stacey, you're, always, you're always getting into other writers you know what is what would this person sing you know what would Celine right. Dion want to sing what would this one want to sing so you, you never you know you become uh, you know you know you need to discover who, who you are and and that's been the most fun for me yeah my, one of my favorite say, uh, sayings in the songwriting session is what would Bowie do you know oh. because he was so inventive uh, yeah. uh, uh harmonically more than any you listen yeah. to the song life on mars and you try to figure that out by ear and it's going to mm -hmm. take you some time because it's, yeah. it's complex. But yeah. yeah, when I, when I was a kid, I think, cause I listened, well, my parents listened to a lot of music. My father listened to jazz and classical. My <laughs> mother listened to show tunes and folk music. And so that was always, and then when I was about 10, 11, I started getting into more rock stuff and, first bands that I listened to, Moby Grape was one of them, which I still consider to be one of the greatest rock bands of all time. That's, it's funny, I was listening to Underground uh, Garage on Sirius. Yeah, he's and a hey, Moby Grape and, fan. Yeah, and uh, Hey Grandma came on and just incredible. Uh, but um, Procol Harum was very influential for me, especially since it featured uh, piano and organ. Uh, with, and since I was into keyboards, I'd figure out those parts. Uh, the second Doors record was very okay. influential. And again, I'd figure out all of uh, Ray Manzarek's keyboard parts. Uh, but eventually also, you know, because my main business in LA was not songwriting. My main business was scoring work, writing music right. for picture, which right. is a whole different mindset. 
We're going to get into so, that a little bit later on. Yeah. So people that were influential in that for me were uh, especially Bernard Herrmann, um, who did Psycho, who did um, all of Hitchcock stuff. Right? A lot of a lot of Hitchcock stuff. The one the one I love the most uh, of his is Vertigo. Um, his first movie that he ever scored was Citizen Kane. So mm -hmm. imagine that's your first project. Wow. So, uh, but the, and then also a very influential record because I mentioned the blues before. My father came home one day and uh, he said, oh, you know, let's listen to this. And it was a, a record called Blues on Top of Blues by B.B. King. And it was recorded in Memphis with a horn section. And he, you know, put the needle on and this band starts up where it goes ba da 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 ba da ba da 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 ba da ba da 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 and he starts singing you're a mean heartbreaker don't you know and i sat there just stunned and listened to this record and i was listening to the keyboard parts and i was thinking i have to learn how to do do what that guy's doing with the piano mm -hmm. there so that's when i really got heavily into listening to the blues yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and if you listen to the English guys that came over here, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the blues, Muddy Waters was very influential to the yeah. Rolling Stones. Um, the Beatles often talk about that. By the way, John, I grew up with Jaco Pastorius. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, down in Florida, right? Yeah, yeah, in Fort Lauderdale. As a matter of fact, it's funny, a lot of the people that are good friends of mine to this day, Will Schreiner, from, you know him from television and everything, and also a gentleman who you wouldn't suspect was an avid surfer. He used to surf with my brother almost every day that he could surf. Um, you would say, oh, there's a stuff shirt, but it was Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. Interesting. He grew up in Fort Lauderdale, then he left after what happened to his family. Is a lot of your success for songwriters um, based on right place, right time, ready to, uh, ready to do what was necessary, you know, opportunity meets preparation kind of a thing? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you know, I often think uh, what would life have been like uh, <clears throat> when Patrick called me if I just said, no, I'm tired. I don't feel like working on a song tonight. You know, it, it, it would have been a whole different thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, that was definitely opportunity and being, you know, in the right place. Um, but it, it was, I think you also create a lot of opportunities that, yes. you know, you don't necessarily see where it comes from. But, you know, as with any business, networking is an important aspect. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and show business, because show business is a 24-7 thing. Yeah. And if you don't love it, you, you move on to something else because you're going to be concentrated on it all the time. John, for you, it's got to be the same, same thing because, uh, you know, you won an Academy Award for two songs in Dirty Dancing. Uh, yeah. We did. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with that. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, it, for success in the business as a songwriter, yes. in, Look, in right it, place, right time kind of a thing. You got to be, you got to be ready. You got to be talented. You got to be ready. And then you got to get lucky. You got to, you know, you got to find yourself in the right situation. And and whether that's through, uh, you know, connections or, or whatever. But uh, you know, you you could you can be really good and never get that right opportunity. I know plenty of guys that have, you know, other musicians that are, you know, more talented than me for sure, and they just never found themselves in the right situation. So I I, no. I think it's. Uh, you know, you just run run into things sometimes, you know. I, I remember uh, I was opening for uh, 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 Engelbert, and I remember he and I got to be very friendly, and, and Kenny Rogers said the same thing. There's a kid somewhere in a cellar singing now that will outtake me in about 10 years, you know. I mean, so you got to always constantly uh, be on guard. John, in 1988, your life changed when you won an ASCAP award. Talk about that. Well, yeah, well, that was uh, the culmination, or not even the culmination, but the, the, the movie came out in 87, and uh, August of 87. And uh, at first, before that, the, the, um, they released, it was a timing problem with Dirty Dancing and when they released The Time of My Life. 
So the, the record label already released the time of my life expecting the film to hit the theaters on a certain date. And somehow the, the, the uh, film got pushed back. And so the song kind of was languishing at adult contemporary. I think it went to like number 28. Right. And, um, and then uh, I believe Jimmy, uh, went, Jimmy Einer, who was the music uh, director for that, uh, when the movie finally caught up and got put out, uh, he he told all the radio people, well, we, yeah, we remixed this, and and so it's a new version, but it was the same version. <laughs> and uh, and when, that, when when the film came out and it just took off, and the movie pushed the song, mm -hmm. and then the song got momentum, and that pushed the movie. So yeah. it was it was a funny uh, situation how, how that happened. And uh, yes, in 1988. The most played song was um, that I've had the time of my life. Coming in number two was also uh, a song Frankie and I wrote, uh, "Hungry Eyes." Frankie and and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago when he was on. He's been on my show a number of times. Um, the night of the Academy Awards, were you with him when Patrick Swayze told him for the first time that that song saved the cast, the crew, and probably the movie? Yeah, you know, he, he tells a story. I'll, I'll tell it again. Uh, you know, uh, I guess, I don't know if it was the Academy. I think it might have been the Golden Globes. Where oh, Golden was. Globes? Okay. And um, we went, all went out afterwards after the Golden Globe. And, um, you know, Patrick explained that they were getting, they were filming out a sequence and they were getting ready to do the, fin the final scene, which they were going to film first. And... Um, they were dancing to a, a, a temp song by uh, Lionel Richie. And um, they, you know, they they were very worried about, you know, they were a little, maybe Stacy can tell you too, they were a little nervous about this movie. It wasn't a lot of money. It was, you know, the, so um, they went, as the story goes, they went through like 150 cassettes. So <laughs> really dating it. Uh, and uh, we were like one of the last songs on one of the last cassettes. And they, as soon as they put that song in, uh, Eleanor Bergstein, the writer, uh, Emil Ardolino, the director, Kenny Ortega, uh, I believe Patrick and Jennifer were there also. They heard that song and they just went, oh my God, do, do we all hear what's happening here? This, we have our song. And so they went and uh, kind of viewed the movie in a whole different way now because they knew yeah they had this big payoff scene to, to build the movie around and towards. So, I mean, the, yeah. the, the, go ahead, Stacey. No, I was going to say that John's right. The, the word on the street, because um, by that point, I was being represented by triad artists as a composer, as a scoring composer. Mm -hmm. And the word through triad, Patrick was also with triad as an actor. So the, 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 what people were saying was, this movie is a dog. It's, uh, and also the production company had no experience with theatrical release. It was Vestron, it was known for videos. So what everybody was saying was, it's gonna go to the theaters for a week, then mm -hmm. go straight to video and it's done. So by the time the movie was released, it was really off my radar because I didn't really expect much from it. Although when I did go to the cast and crew screening in LA, um, I remember walking out of the theater with Wendy and I turned to her and I said, you know, I actually thought that was pretty good. That wasn't nearly as bad as everybody was saying. And, um, and then of course, you know, ev everybody was proved wrong. It, it, it just exploded. To yeah. This day. To this day, they were proven wrong. I don't know, Stacey, did you get to see, I saw the, before they had the final edit and um, we went in and saw it and it was a lot longer. It was a lot steamier, actually. There was, a, it was much, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a PG-13. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was good, but it was, it felt, you know, felt a little awkward at times and uh, a little long. And then when we went back and saw the edited, version uh you know we started to get excited but yeah. eleanor, eleanor bergstein will tell the story of how they were the company vestron was trying to do a clear acne commercial with it or you know just 
put it out, go straight to video and forget about it, you know, and uh, yeah. she once again proved them wrong too. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be the first time Hollywood was wrong about anything, you know, I yeah. mean, uh, you know. It wasn't very a Hollywood movie, right? It, the best drama was yeah. out of Connecticut and um, it was filmed here on, on the East Coast, so. Yeah, it, yeah. it was It was just, the, it was so unexpected. I remember uh, the um, record producer who produced uh, she's like the wind and also time, time in my life, Michael Lloyd, um, called me uh, to tell me that I was going to get a gold record for the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I said, oh, that's great. You know, because I wasn't really in the record business. So I said, that's that's such a thrill. And like a week and a half later, I called him. I said, when do I get the gold record? You know, I didn't know, <laughs> how, I didn't know how it works. So he told me, he said, you're not getting a gold record. And I said, why? You told me I'm getting a gold record. He says, because now you're getting a platinum record. Uh. And he said, the album sold 280,000 copies last Sunday. And, um, so, and so he was the one that said to me, he said, we're riding a wave here and no one knows where this is taking us. Mm -hmm. well, it was dead on. Yes. Well, you know, yeah. it, it never ceases to amaze me how many, how many things currently I mean, you know, I, I, we get a call from a, a person that admins for, for the songs and constantly getting calls for, for this movie, that movie, commercials. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's something about Dirty Dancing has become uh, in the vernacular of, of American culture. You know, nobody yeah. baby in the corner. Uh, you know, that movie Get Out, the, uh, you know, the strange use of, yeah. of uh, the time of my life. I mean, it's just, uh, what's her name? Um, um, New Girl, I think it's called New Girl. The, the, the first episode, the pilot episode, was based on the time of my life and, and that song and that movie. So, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it, for years it's stayed there. I don't know why or how, but I thank God. <laughs> well, I mean, here's, here's an example. Um, my, my brain just went blank, but John, was it you or over Stacy? Yeah. You wrote the first year of uh, Beverly Hills 90210. They used the song. It was you, John. No, and, it, was, no it was me. Yeah. It was you, Stacy. I'm sorry. I'm um, and, away, but, uh, and they but, used it, really and then they did. Then they stopped using it. What was the reason why they stopped using it? Well, it, it's an interesting story. First off, I um, co-wrote that theme with uh, a dear friend of mine, Jeff Skunk Baxter, the great guitarist from the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan. Yeah. And um, and I'll, I'll never forget, we wanted to use sax on it. So I said, hey, yeah, you know, what studio musician should we get? So he says, I'll call Edgar. And I said, Edgar who? <laughs> Edgar Winter. Edgar Winter. So wow. Ed, Edgar Winter shows up to the studio to, to do it. But everybody really liked what we did. But the opening to uh, uh, the original Beverly Hills 90210, uh, uh, what's his name? Aaron Spelling, the producer, hated the opening graphics. He hated it. And he got went into a tirade about it, from what I understand. He fired the producers that were responsible for the opening uh, you know, montage. And he axed the whole opening, including our theme. Oh, wow. And wow. so we were kind of a, a, um, a casualty <clears throat> of war there. Uh, you know, and uh, so it can only be seen on the original pilot or heard on the original pilot. But then what happened was uh, one of the other producers who was not fired, um, I think he felt bad about it. And he ended up hiring me to score a, a, a load of the episodes. Oh. So I, I scored about eight to 10 episodes in the first couple of seasons. You're listening to Main Street. Uh, Stacey Weidlitz is with us, along with John D. Nicola. I'm Gary Allen. Hope you're enjoying the show. We're here every Friday at 4 p.m. Remember, next week, I won't be with you. I'm taking some time off and getting some things taken care of. Uh, Stacey, you wrote a lot of themes for television shows. You worked with a gentleman who I would love to meet someday because I have one question for him, and that's Mel Brooks. You also worked with Quincy Jones, who I did meet the night of uh, We Are the World. And, and you also worked with uh, uh, Glenn Fry and uh, so many other people. Uh, what was it like working with Mel? Well, I, I didn't actually work with Mel. I got to sit with him in his office 
and talk with him for an hour and a half because I was up for a film that he was producing. However, I did work with his wife, Anne Bancroft. Oh, yes. Uh, three years prior to that uh, on, a, on a show that ABC did. They tried to revive the old um, satirical show, That Was the Week That Was. Oh, and yes. So the, the co-hosts were David Frost, the original host, and Anne Bancroft. And I wrote um, music for the show, kind of music directed the show. And uh, the producers called me one day and says, Anne's going to do a, a satirical song. Uh, and we want you to accompany her on the piano just off camera. So you have to go to her house and, you know, work with her. And she was unbelievably gracious. Mm -hmm. But what, what was funny that tied into my conversation with Mel Brooks was at one point she was reading cue cards and this is the Reagan era. And so, and she said, and president Ronald Reagan said, and the direct director stopped her and said, and we got to back up. And she said, why? And this voice from the audience yelled out distinctly, Mel Brooks, you said Reagan, <laughs> who says Reagan? It's Reagan. <laughs> and so the, the whole place just broke up because they knew exactly who it was. And yeah. so when I, my meeting with Mel Brooks was supposed to be five to 10 minutes and it was down to me and two other more heavyweight composers. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I sat down in his office and I said, you know, I, I rehearsed at your house with your wife. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, for that was the week that was. And he says, uh, he said, I was in the audience. I said, I know everybody knew you were in the audience because you yelled at her. So, and he actually said to me in his office, who says Regan? <laughs> so, uh, Regan. <laughs> but um, it turned out that uh, he was from a part of Brooklyn, Brownsville that my parents were from. Oh, and, yeah. and even though I, I, I didn't get the movie, um, I call it my greatest rejection ever because it was just such a pleasure because he, he was one of my idols from the 2000 year old man. Also yes. the producers and young Frankenstein are my two favorite comedies. Yeah. And um, so uh, sitting and talking with him was just fascinating. Yeah. Um, what was the movie? It was the fly Two Cause I was being typecast into horror movies mm. and uh, it was actually a very grisly movie. Um, <clears throat> and so really? in a way I was almost glad that I, I didn't get it because I'd have been gut wrenched for about a month working on that thing. I I only want to meet him to ask one question in the movie Blazing Saddles. Uh, when they get to the point, well, would you give me twenty four hours? We won't even give you whatever. Will you do it for? Uh, I, I forget the the cowboy's name that they used. And I thought, why that one instead of John Wayne or who oh, Gibson or some? It's know. Rand Randolph Scott. Now I know Randolph Scott was a huge star. Yeah, it's a huge star. But I was just wondering if that was one of Mel's favorite things. Mel talks about and in and, 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 and there was a couple that no one ever figured would get along. It's like it's like the love of my life who I never got to meet, Suzanne Plachette. She was married to uh, the gentleman who was on Newhart, uh, as the when he uh, he did the country in. When he did the country in, he was the maintenance guy. Yeah. You know, two people all uh, you also did an animated picture, which I'm fascinated because I love animation, called Crow. About when you get called in, and John, I don't know if you've ever done any animation at all whatsoever as far as the scoring, but when they call you in, do they have a storyboard in front of you like they do for the voiceover actors to kind of say, this is what we're thinking of and this is the direction we're going in? Sometimes uh, animation is done like that. Um, actually, in the classic Warner Brothers cartoons, Carl Stalling, who was the, the great composer, uh, didn't even have a storyboard. He had a script. And um, he'd write the music to the script so wow. that, and they'd animate to the music and the voiceovers. Wow. Uh, and it, in the case of Crow, it was done more traditionally for scoring where they delivered me the picture with time code and I sat down and I wrote my score to the, to the picture. I also wrote the, uh, the opening title song for, for the show, yeah. uh, which was, it had to have lyrics. And the, the story is so convoluted in a way it's it's about a crow magnon boy who's orphaned and uh, is adopted by neanderthals who are kind of goofy and he befriends a woolly mammoth named phil who lives in a town called woollyville 
that's filled with all <laughs> these very scientific, educated mammoths. Yes. Phil, Phil falls into a glacier, is frozen in time, and is thought out in modern times by a scientist, uh, a Latina scientist named Dr. C. And this whole, sto <laughs> this whole story, had to, be, awesome. it, it had to be told in a 58 second opening song. Mm -hmm. So my, my first lyric that I wrote was, um, Crow uh, was a smart boy, had a lot on the ball, but the family that took him in was total Neanderthal. And so then, <laughs> then we were off and running. Oh I'm God! Where, where, where can you see that on like uh, um, Netflix? Uh, not on Netflix. You can find episodes on YouTube. Oh, it's uh, episodes. Yeah, it's a bunch of shows. Yeah, it, it, yeah I did two seasons. Oh, of movie. Okay. Yeah, and it's um, uh, and each episode had a scientific concept delivered in entertainment form. Wow! Because because the two production companies were Film Roman on the West Coast, who did The Simpsons and um, Children's Television Workshop on the East Coast that did Sesame Street. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was a really, it, it was very difficult. I mean, for three months, I woke up every morning. I would, I had to write 22 minutes of finished music for every episode, because it was wall to wall, as we say, you know, constant music. And the next day, get up and start the next episode. And that was my life for about three months. It was, it was grueling. What did, you, what did you do after that for three months? You took a vacation. Yes, I went to Hawaii with my, <laughs> my then girlfriend, Karen. Uh, and uh, so, uh, matter of fact, I had one day off in the three months that was accidental because they delivered me a bad tape. <laughs> and so I took that day to go to a travel agent and I said, October, uh, October 22nd, I want to be sitting staring out a window at the South Pacific with a cigar in this hand and a brandy in the other hand. Can you make that happen? And, and she did actually. Yeah. Did you do that mostly when you approach something like that? Are you mostly sitting at the piano or a keyboard or? or? It, it, uh, the th basic thematic elements I tend to come up with at the piano uh, and an acoustic piano, which I'm sitting at right now. So, uh, uh, because there's something I call it psychoacoustics, where there's ah. something about the sound surrounding you, but then to get down to the um, uh, nitty gritty of it, because uh, that score was done all synth, all MIDI. Then I'm sitting at my computer with my array of synthesizers, and, and uh, but yeah, the basic thematic material I, I try to develop at the piano. John, I want to talk about why because, and I'm. Very curious about the title. Yeah, the why because well, you know, after uh, being in the business for many many years, I uh, I started to check out my new. Uh, my, my, is that me or you? Oh, yeah. It's not me. It's not me. But they're but they're persistent. Whoever they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's an eight hundred number. I don't know how. Oh, they're, they're oh man, I get so much spam calls. It's oh. like. Um, they're offering me deals on my credit cards that I don't even have credit cards for. Anyway, the why uh, because. So why because. So I started, uh, I put a recording studio in my barn and I started to um, just recall, go away. How do I shut this thing off? Go I don't away. know. There you go. Right. Go ahead. Uh, and um, so the why because the title comes from something my son uh, said when he was a kid, when he figured something out, he'd go like, he'd go, oh, that's the why because. And so it just stuck as a phrase. And, uh, you know, the why because I, when I put all the songs together, it, it, it was, you know, the why because being family, um, you know, uh, music, art, and, and family. And, and that's uh, the, the, actually the album cover. Uh, was this this was done by my wife's brother mm -hmm. when he was 17 and that's yeah. his grandfather and his aunt and um so it was just a connection uh, the why because my son said that when he figured stuff out and and um this is the why because you know like i said music art uh family and yeah that, that's the back actually has and some of the songs in it, of course. What's it? Oh yes, 
family. And I know the barn. I've seen you buy the barn with the dog, and and I think that's so cute. I think that is so very cute. Yep, there it is. I don't like. Yeah, there you go. Hey, listen. I used to have one of those until I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my wife met me. I was uh, doing stand up at the Improv, and uh, she was in. She worked for J. Walter Thompson. As a matter of fact, I, I auditioned for the new voice of Captain Crunch. Almost got it until somebody said uh, another actor who was jealous said his wife works for J. Walter Thompson, and that eliminated me right away because it was J. Wally that was doing it, and she had no idea I was auditioning for uh, it. Uh, you know, oh, I always, I always hated that. I always hated that. Um, who would be a singer or a group that both of you would love to have, whether it's past or present, you'd love to write a song for or or collaborate on an album with? Well, you know, Stacy mentioned earlier uh, Procol Harum, and um, I've written two songs, three or well, maybe more, maybe like five songs with. Uh, Keith Reed, who is the oh, lyricist yeah. of Procol Harum. And in fact, on the Why Because, uh, there's a song that I wrote with him and John Waite and Anthony Kryzon called In God's Shadow. Uh, um, Keith wrote the lyrics. And for this new record uh, that I'm just finishing, I asked Keith for some lyrics. Uh, usually uh, I work from music and then I give that to a lyricist or a lyrical idea, and and then they take it and finish the lyrics. Uh, this was uh, the other way around uh, for once. I just said, Keith, you have something laying around, and he sent me something, and I immediately just picked something off in my head, and we just finished the song up. So there's someone maybe we would would both like to to write with. Yeah, yeah. But I I always wanted to write with Marilyn and Alan Bergman. Oh, uh, yes. probably because of my movie, you know, obsession. But I, I just, you know, the way we were is still to me one of the most beautiful movie songs ever written. Uh, if Marvin Hamlish had written <clears throat> just that, it would have been enough. Um, but yeah, they they were two that I I would have loved to have worked with. Yeah, I had Melissa Manchester on last week, and she spoke of them quite highly oh. in, in her, in her wonderful career. Um, when someone comes to your house, if I went and looked at your CD players, whether it's your car or home, who's on there? I, I, I have a constant rotation of, uh, especially when I'd have a, a woman over for dinner, this was my setup. And, uh, one of them was, uh, it, is um, Frank Sinatra sings for Only the Lonely, which oh. is when he did all ballads, <clears throat> Nelson Riddle doing the arrangements, which were incredible. And Frank Sinatra was bipolar, and he recorded this record at one of his low points. I think it was after Ava Gardner had left him or something. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just every song just drips with emotion and beauty. And so that's one. And then uh, an Ella Fitzgerald... Um, uh, American songbook. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I I don't listen to CDs. I have vinyl. I have a, a record player in almost every room, everywhere I go. I just love vinyl. Right. Uh, lately, you know, I, I, um, there's so many things, but I just got a um, Abbey Road did a a a, a remake a remastering of Derek and the Dominoes. I wasn't even a uh, huge fan of that record, really. But I've, I've gotten into that. It sounds sonically so much better than it did back in the day. Uh, so I, that, um, you know, I'll always have a traffic record on, uh, um, you know, kind of all over the place. Uh, uh, John McLaughlin's record, uh, My Goals Beyond, is, mm -hmm. probably gets the most airplay. I've been listening to a lot of Soft Machine lately, if you remember them. They're yeah. obscure. Yeah. Laura Nero. I, I love myself, Tony Bennett, and I've worked with Tony and, uh, you know, and, and, and I love classical music, Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto Number no. 2 or one of Beethoven's Piano Concertos or something like that. I just, you know, I just kind of get into it. And I can listen to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and, you know, and groups like that. And even the Dave Clark Five, who nobody remembers anymore. They're a great band. They were. 
Unfortunately, yeah. as Dave, who's still alive, says, oh, the lads are basically all gone, you know, they're, they definitely all flew away. Um, I got to meet Frank, Sammy, and Dean on one occasion through an uncle. So that was kind of a fun for me because I got to know one of Dean's sons, and it was always a pleasure being around Dean Martin. And would you say that when it came to somebody like Dean Martin, Tony Bennett, and great singers in general, it's the phrasing that really brings it home? It, it's the phrase, but also the voice. I mean, to, uh, Tony Bennett's voice is on, one of my favorite records of all time is Tony Bennett and Bill Evans, where it's just piano and voice yeah. Yeah. because it's so stark and you can't hide anything. No. And it's his voice on that when he does, he does a song from On the Town by uh, Leonard mm -hmm. Bernstein and uh, Comden and Green called um, Some Other Time, which is such a mournful you know, we'll catch up some other time, you know, yeah. and it's, it's, it's so beautiful the way he does it with Bill Evans, who was, you know, just a genius. Yes. Well, but yeah, Bill Evans was just, just out of the sight. It sort of reminds you of that World War II song, We'll Meet Again. Yeah. You know, don't know, no, don't know where, don't know when kind of a kind of thing. My favorite Tony Bennett, and I have a lot of them and I've told him that Mr. Benedetto, because I don't call him Bennett. I call him Mr. Benedetto is is I remember you when he does that version of that. Uh, I love it. Engelbert also is a great phraser. We've got a few minutes left in, in the program. Um, if you could change something in the business, your end of the business, what would it be? Oh, that's easy. Streaming is 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 uh, a dead end for yeah. all musicians, all music, all songwriters, all artists. Streaming is, I guess I can't say it's going to be the end of it because somehow it'll survive. But it, if you could change anything, it would be uh, what what they've set up now with Spotify's, even Apple Music, uh, right. Tidal, all of them. They pay nothing, and yeah. they're making plenty of money. They're making the, the bulk of it. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting. My wife was just telling a story when she was a kid. The uh, wheat farmers, uh, they had a thing that they did where they go in front of the um, supermarket and they hold, they have a little stand and they say, here, here's the penny. This represents what the farmer gets from that loaf of bread that you that you just bought. And I said, gee, that's that's the music industry right now. That's it. I mean, it's like you're lucky if you get a penny. It a, a stream. I get about 13 million. I haven't looked lately, but about 13 million streams per quarter. It's a few hundred dollars. 13 million streams. You know, a, a band starting out is if they get 200,000 streams, they're excited. What is that? Mm -hmm. 30 cents, 20 cents. I mean, it's just it's un workable it's it's can't it can't keep going like this yeah, yeah and, and that that i i agree with john a hundred percent and i think that goes back to a, uh, an issue that is even behind that and that's a lack of respect for the creators yes uh that you know that it's one of the reasons that attracted me to nashville <clears throat> and why i moved here was that i suddenly found myself in an environment where the people that write the music are getting some respect uh, and and are held in high regard, no matter how old or how young they are. Yeah. And uh, but this, you know, attitude of music is free or almost free is, is has been um, killing the industry. It's unsustainable. Yeah. Do you think it? You think it has a lot to do with the push button society that we live in? Garbage in, garbage out. I don't yeah, know if it's, it's short attention spans. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, because it seems like in, in, in as far as actors are concerned, like I watched about 10 minutes of the Academy Awards. Number one, I didn't think it was a great production. But number two, I didn't see any of those movies. And because of COVID, I'm sure most people didn't. I don't know. The actors don't seem to have any staying power anymore. I don't know if that's a product of Hollywood or whether it's a product of the fact that it's it's like it's like it, it's like a friend of mine who was on a soap opera for many years, Tony Geary. Uh, he was on General Hospital and uh, he played Luke. Yeah. And um, he said to me one day, we were sitting and this is 30 years ago. And he said to me, he said, you know, this business is getting to be like the porn industry. It's like fresh faces every day. Got to have a fresh face, new actor, new actress. As soon as they get to be a certain age, you're pushed out. 
you know, regardless of your ability. And he says, there's no staying power anymore. Everybody wants something new, the new this, the new. I mean, how many new iPhones and how many new gadgets on those phones are really going to be different from the one that you already currently have? Man, yeah, it, it's funny. Uh, years ago, I met with a, uh, a music supervisor at one of the, the film studios uh, at Warner Brothers. And he it was when I was kind of starting in the scoring work. Um, and uh, he said to me, he said, here's your career in five steps. Who's Stacy Weidlitz? Get me Stacy Weidlitz. Stacy Weidlitz is too busy. Get me somebody like Stacy Weidlitz. No, I'll pass on Stacy Weidlitz. And then the last one is who's Stacy Weidlitz? Oh, no, so, I... you know, it's just, you know, that, that circle. So it, yeah. it, it, it's you know, something that you have to um, expect to a certain degree, but the, the ageism in the business has, has gotten bad. Imagine and if has been that, yeah. one, one last question before we go. Um, what advice would you give to anybody out there who is sitting and watching or they, want, they, they think they can write music? Just get out there and do it. Go ahead, Stacey. Um, I would say, I'll, I'll never forget when I started lessons with a classical teacher on Long Island when I was in ninth grade. Uh, he had me take up a, a Chopin mazurka and he wrote at the top, be intensely self-critical. And it was actually great advice uh, yeah. because you've got to really analyze what you're doing and look at it and compare it to what's marketable out there and what people are making money at and and be very very self-aware and self-critical at the same time also not being intimidated by competition and that's yeah. another thing that i would say is don't think about the competition think about yourself you know yeah i would say you probably if you're going to do it it's probably because you have to do it yeah you know what i mean it, it's uh I didn't really have a choice, you know. I, I guess I did, but I, I, you know, I was myopic. I wanted, I want to do this, and so, yeah. in a way, uh, you know, uh, you have to, you have to be in it to win it. I mean, you, you, you have to be trying. You have to go for it. I mean, if that's what yeah. you're driven to do, then uh, anything we say, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, you're just gonna do it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's like I said at the top of the hour. If there's something else in this world you want to do besides show business of any kind, whatever end of it is, go and do it because you're never going to be completely satisfied because this business will eat you up 24 seven. And I want to thank both of you, Stacey Weidlitz and John D. Nicola for joining me for this hour of Main Street. You guys have been great. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay on there. We'll talk right after the show. And to all of you out there, I want to thank you for joining us here on Main Street. Remember, next week at 4, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be somewhere else doing something. But I'll be back in a, the week after with uh, Jeffrey Mark, who is a walking encyclopedia of Hollywood knowledge. I want to thank you all for joining me here this Friday. And until next time, take care of yourselves and each other.